In a small town down in Georgia Over 40 years ago Her maiden name was Music Until she met that Jackson boy They married young like folks did then Not a penny to their name they believed that one another should always stay the same. And on the land his daddy gave them a foundation underway for a love to last forever until their dying day. They built a bond strong enough to stand the test of time and in a place for us to turn. When our lives were in a bind And they made their house From a tool shed Granddaddy rolled down on two logs And they built walls all around it And they made that house a home And they taught us about good living And they taught us right and wrong Lord, there'll never be another place In this world My mama raised five children, four girls, and there was me. She found her strength with faith in God and love of family. She never had a social life, home was all she knew, except the time she took a job to pay a bill or two. My daddy skinned his knuckles on the cars that he repaired. He never earned much money, but he gave us all he had. He never made the front page, but he did the best he could. Folks drove the cars from miles around to let him look underneath the hood. And they made their house from a tool shed granddaddy rolled down on two logs. And they built They taught us about good living They taught us right and wrong Lord, there'll never be another place In this world I call home No, there'll never be another place In this world that I'll call home Good morning. How's the family this morning? The house is full. Amen. All right, goodness. You know, I told somebody uh, that uh, when you get this kind of rain, especially in little towns that don't normally get 20 inches, uh, we didn't get that much at my house, but uh, I told them my boat's parked right next door to my house and little animals line up two by two. Something might be going on here. So, no, it's uh, we want to thank the band for what they do. Golly. Fletcher, good to see you, buddy. Thanks for bringing us some special music today. We appreciate that. You know, um, once again, I asked Nick, and I call on Nick a whole lot, and Terry and the band to, to uh, play a song for me every once in a while that kind of uh, leads me into a, a message. I'm, I'm a big music fan. I, I love uh, uh, music, and I, I, you know, some people tell me, well, I can, I can make a song out of a sermon, and I think I'm the opposite. I, I think I... Uh, Take a, I'm sorry, they make a sermon out of a song, and that's, that's what I do. I, I think sometimes uh, I hear a certain song. I spend a lot of time in my truck driving around from different jobs, and a certain song will just reach down and grab me sometimes, and it'll say, you know, it, it, it affects the heart, and that's where Jesus is. So sometimes I, I uh, have to call on these guys and say, hey, would you mind playing this song for me right at the end? It's kind of going to tie into what, what we're going to do today. And... Uh, after I talked to him, I had a conversation with God, and uh, this is the message today he laid on my heart, and it's about home. 
Uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we come to you today, and Father God, we're just so thankful. We're thankful for all the blessings and favor you continue to pour out here on our church house and this church family. Father God, we thank you for the unity that you uh, bring everyone together just to be here to worship you today. Father, I pray today that you just move me out of the way. Father, that what's presented here today is what you felt like needed to be brought to each and every individual here. And it comes from you, Father God. I'm just the vessel. So, Father, let's pray today that everything we do here, that it's pleasing, uplifting, and glorifying to you. I ask this in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen. Well, the song you just heard is it's simply called that, Home. Uh, not much more to it. It was written by Alan Jackson. And it, he wrote that song the first week after he moved to Nashville because he was homesick. He, was, uh, he missed home. His family's really tight. And uh, the song was kind of dedicated to his parents for all that they had done for him. And I'm sure many of you, along with me, have, at some point in our lives have been homesick. You know, we might not have been gone away from home more than a week at a time or a few days, but we can get a little homesick sometimes, not just for our home itself, but our community, because it all ties together. And you know, the, the family bond is, is probably one of the most important things that we, ha we have going on in a home, is that the family needs to be tied. And for many of us, you know, our mom and dad may already have passed away. And that you kind of lose a little bit of that, that family bond. You know, there's a, there's a void in your life when that happens that you don't realize how much the family home meant, meant to you till that, till that happens. You know, I, I, we always, our, my mom was a very strong person. She, we thought mom ran the household, or not necessarily ran the household, but she, she, did, she took care of everything because dad worked every day. She was a stay-at-home mom. She worked every once in a while, like the song said, when, when it was needed you know, for extra stuff, but dad did, did the majority of the work. So mom, she took care of the raising the kids and doing everything, and, and uh, I guess mom even kind of felt like, even herself, that she was the, the, uh, the leader, the major person in the household because she did so much. But you know, once uh, my dad passed away, it seemed like we didn't tend to do as many family functions. We didn't, we didn't go to uh, mom's house as much or the family home as much because that void was there and it didn't, dad, you could tell dad was the leader. Dad was the structural leader of the household. And so the dynamics change a little bit, but you still yearn for that home where, where you grew up. You know, many of us here today that uh, if you grew up in a home that uh, you knew any time that you were down and out or you were in need of anything, your family was there for you. They were always there to support you and um, that you could always go home knowing when I get there, they're going to make everything all right. You know, it, it was a good feeling and, and we've kind of lost some of that in, in the culture now. You know, um, it seems like a lot of it had to do with small town, town America more than anything else. You know, I grew up in a, a very small town, Mansfield, Texas. Didn't have probably 1,500 people when I was a child. Shortly after that, I, I, I moved to Cedar Hill. They had 5,000 people. The community was the home. It wasn't just our home life, but the community itself where everybody pretty well knew each other, where everybody cared about each other. And that's basically where Jesus leads us, is that we should be at that point where we care about our neighbors and we care about our family and we care about each other. As we say right here in this church, you're our family. And family is very, very important. And it's very important to God. If you remember, if we reflected back to the book of Luke and uh, the parable of the lost son or the prodigal son, and that's uh, Luke 15 if you want to go there, but I'm, I'm not going to read it to you. I, you know, uh, I know the story. And, and the thing is that uh, this, this man, he had these two sons that worked on his, his farm, basically. And they, they uh, you know, they grew up there. And finally they got to that, one of the sons got to that age where he thought he knew everything. He thought he had it all together and he wanted his part of the inheritance and he was going to take it and he was going to either have a good time or make something out of himself or take off with it, right? So the father 
instead of rejecting that, he allowed him to have his inheritance and the son took off. And surely not a short time later, not very much time later, he had already blown all the money. He had already spent the inheritance and he had to go to work for another man, a pig farmer evidently that uh, he went to work for because he found himself down and out and feeding pigs. You know, and, and really lower than the hired help there. You know, he, he'd got hit rock bottom. And between all this, you know, he, he had said that, well, you know, I know I've sinned against God and I've sinned against my father, knowing what I did. And, I, you know, I know, I know my father. So I'm going to go back home, uh, humble myself. That's a big word right there. I'm going to humble myself and I'm going to go back home. And I'm going to say to my father, hey, I've sinned against you. I mean, the God and you. And, and, you know, I'm not fit to be your son. But through all that, he did that. He came back home. And what does the Bible tell us that the son ran? I mean, the father ran out to meet the son. He saw him coming, so he ran out to meet him. And he, and he wrapped his arms around him, gave him a kiss, and he just loved him. He just cared that much about him. But he knew that. The son had already figured it out. He had already figured out how he made this big mistake. But he knew that he could always come home. He could always come home. He wasn't real sure about what was going to happen when he got there. But he, but he had that feeling of that bond with his family that he could come home. And sure enough, his father accepted him. Now, his brother wasn't real happy about the situation. We know that. That sibling rivalry. But I think what he didn't, the, the other brother didn't understand this son was lost. Not only lost to the family, he was lost to the Lord. And when somebody comes back to the Lord, it's time for a party. Amen? That, that's, that's the whole deal to do with the, the home life. And in most homes like this that we're talking about, the father was the leader, the protector, and the provider. He did all that. Now, the mom was everything else. She actually did part of that, but she was everything else. But she seemed to have more understanding and more love and more compassion than the father did. The father had to be a little bit more direct and a little bit stronger. And any of you that grew up in a small town America, as I talked about, you know the kind of home I'm talking about. You know what that kind of home's like. A home that was stable. And when we talk about stable, a lot of homes now, people refer to them as dysfunctional. You know, I have a dysfunctional family or whatever they say. But when you're in a stable home, or you grew up in a stable home, it had a balance. It had a balance of love, but it had a balance of discipline. Amen? And many of us know that. You know, uh, the discipline was appropriate, and the love was appropriate. It was a well-balanced. And you respected that. Maybe at that age, at a younger age, we didn't as kids. But as we got older, when mom and dad wasn't around anymore, then you wish that you had that one more chance, right? So, so today, home is about that. It's about spending that time. It's about understanding more about your family. Some of you still have your moms and dads. I pray that you're spending a lot of time with them. I pray that you grew up in a good household. And if, if you've lived, if you live now, or you've lived in a home like this, that's a blessed home, amen? And you need to appreciate that, and you need to appreciate that more about where you came from and your home should be sacred just as sacred as you consider the church it should be many Christians today they don't see their home that way they really don't they don't see their home as being somewhere sacred they see that when they go to church they've undervalued and underestimated God's perspective totally about the heart of the home we know that we, we see it every day that that, that God's not in all the homes. They, he's kind of in there. You know, as, as Christians, some of them kind of put him in there when it's convenient. But I'd like to remind you today of the importance of home, family, and how the home is important to God and the family. The Bible tells us that God began human existence with marriage and with family. That's how it all began. Before the uh, tabernacle, many of you may know uh, Moses, the formal place of worship for the Israelites was the home, and the worship was directed and led by the head of the home, the husband or the father. That's, that's early on. 
And, and we know it was very, very important to God. The first community that God established was family and home. The first community, Adam and Eve, right? So they, they had a family, and, and now they, they created a lot of this sin for us, right? We know that. But that was the start of it all. It was important to God for family. It was important that that unity and that bond grew between families. But also God wanted that bond to grow between the families and him. Not dis disregard that part. Many people have replaced the home with church. And you say, well, where are you going with that? Well, for many Christians and their families, spiritual, spirit, spirituality is only shown in the home. I mean in church, not in the home. Everything to do with God is at church. When we take our kids to church or we go visit church, that's where everything spiritually happens. That's where God is. That's where it goes on. But it, but it tends to be less and less in home. All prayers are in church. All teachings are in church. And none, none of this sometimes is done in the home. Even though people come to church on Sundays, they walk out this door and they don't take God with them. They leave him right here because this is where he's supposed to be. And, and believe it or not, they're Christians that feel that way. But if you want a solid home, you start with God. Amen? Today, in too many Christian homes, there's been an absence. An absence of responsibility and godly leadership. That is a fact, and that's a proven fact. And family worship and spiritual discipline is no longer in the home. It's expected at the church. They're supposed to get it at the church, but not in home. That's not true. The balance of discipline and love is totally out of balance. People correct their kids for the wrong things and okay the right things. You see that going on all the time. And they don't use God to their advantage. And that's what God's there for. God, God should be center point in your home. And everything else comes after that. Amen? Many of you know me. And you know that I'm a huge fan of the Andy Griffin Show. There's some people in this church that ringtone is Andy Griffin when I call. They know how I feel about Andy Griffin and, and the show that he had. And many of you that are baby boomers or the age of that age and maybe before, you understand why. The Andy Griffin show just reflected what small town America was about. It was about home and it was about family. It revealed how people should treat one another. And you know, when you watch that show, or when I watch that show, I want to be right there. You know, if you ever seen the series where the guy came there and he knew all about the town because he read about it in a newspaper and he knew everybody because he wanted that to be his hometown. Because he loved what he read and he loved what was going on there. And, and I think even though that was just a show, and we have to realize it was just a show, but each show provided a message. In fact, some of those shows have been used in Christian messages all over the place. There are videos out and used in discipleship from those shows because they reflected how God wanted us to act and how a home should be. It re revealed how people should treat each other in a day-to-day -day life, not just in church, but in, at home, in the community, at work, everywhere you go, it revealed how you should treat people. You know, I know Andy would get a little upset with Barney every once in a while. You know, I'd, I, I'd see him about pull his hair out, but he treated him with respect, kindness, and love. You know, it, it, our church is a little bit like that. I've told people before, we're a little like Mayberry here. We got the Andys, we got the Aunt Bees, we, you know, we, we have the Barneys. We have some Goobers and Gomers too, but, you know, I won't point out nobody, but uh, you know who you are. But they all loved one another and they all cared about one another. And it seemed that the people in Mayberry didn't live for worldly things. But God and each other. It was a simple place. Where everyone seemed happy much of the time. You know, nowadays in today's society, that simple place is hard to get to. It, it, it really is. You have to want to get there. But you know what? It's always not about everybody else. It's about your walk with God. If you're walking with God, if your home has God in it, if you're teaching your children right, 
then you're improving your part of that world. I always say I can't fix the whole world, but I can fix my little piece of it. Because it's my attitude and how I get up in the mornings and what my kids look at. I had someone that uh, provided me with a little piece of paper here that uh, they thought was the reason everybody was happy in the town of Mayberry. I want to read that to you. Pretty interesting little article. It says, it just dawned on me why Mayberry was so peaceful and quiet. Nobody was married. <laughs> Here are the single people that come to mind. Andy, Aunt B, Barney, Floyd Hard, Goober Gomer, Sam, Ernest T. Bass, the Darlin family, Helen, Thelma, Thelma Lou, and Clara. In fact, the only married one was Otis, and he stayed drunk all the time. That's wrong. That's so wrong. You're right. Ladies, we're not taking anything away from you. You're laughing with me, okay? That's My question for everyone here today would be, is your home blessed? Is your home blessed? And if it's not, how can we achieve this? How can we achieve to get in our home where it needs to be? Well, choose to make your home a home. Some people say choose to make your house a home. Because some people refer it, this is my house. Well, we can't do that. It needs to be our home. It needs to mean something to us as it does to God. Joshua 24, 15. As for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Amen? So the Lord's number one. And Joshua made a choice for his home. He had, he had uh, decided to make this choice. And his choice was for his household to serve God and God only. And to worship God and God only. The one and only God. Regardless of how anybody else chose around him, uh, what their choice was, Joshua's wife and children knew which way Joshua was going to lead them. There was no doubt. He made it very clear to them, we will follow God. Amen? So, we know he had a blessed house because of that. And that's why I asked, is your home blessed? So is our home? His home? Do you ever look at it that way? Is our home his home, the Almighty God? It does us no good to say, of course, my home is his home because I'm a Christian. It does us no good to say that. It involves a lot more than just that and just saying that. Do we behave at home different than we do at church? Do we come into church and we get the word and we act all good and we, our kids, we, we want our kids to see what a Christian looks like? We want them to grow up being Christians and that love and, and sharing with everyone else. And then we go home and we scream and yell and we act a fool? Don't, don't tell me none of you haven't done it. I've been there. Pre-Christian days. Every once in a while they can push a little button and get you there now. But that's the deal. Who you are here is who you need to be everywhere you go. If you are a child of God and you are walking with God, everybody ought to see it everywhere you go. Amen? No changes there. Living and showing our personal relationship with God in our homes and not only at church will make a difference in your home, make a difference in your job, make a difference in your community and in your life. If you show you have that personal relationship, even though a person is not a Christian, and they don't, they don't really understand where you're at because many of you have been there before you came a Christian, right? Many of you have been there where, where you were running with the, this, this group and y'all were a little out of control maybe or you weren't really walking that Christian walk and then all at once God struck you as he did Paul on the road to Damascus and all at once you're, you're in that Christian walk and you're doing it the right way and they're looking at you like, oh, what happened to you? And then they start to distance themselves a little bit from you. And I've had that happen. Do you know what's remarkable? Even that person that's not walking with God, when something happens in his life, whether it's health, it's strategy, or whatever, who do you think they're calling? They're calling me. Then if that's the only seed we plant, then that's the seed we plant. Amen? Same thing in your home. If that's the only seed you plant in your kid's life, plant that seed first. Because that's what they see. Your grandkids, your family around you. They may not like the change in you, but I'll tell you this, you start planting the seeds and the changes start and they happen. All my children are saved Christians. When I first started the church at Ellis County 10 years ago, they weren't. And I didn't push it on them. 
I didn't shove it down their throats. I made a change. I showed them what God could do right here for someone like me. They saw that. They started the change. And their children are Christians. Their children are learning all about God. So it's contagious if you put it out there. But you've got to be the same at home as you are in church. You've got to be the same person. You know, if you, every one of us is going to fall down, now the Bible tells us that. And you're going to have these slip-ups. But the minute you do it and you apologize to God, apologize to your kids and family. They deserve that too, amen? And God's going to bless it. You see households every day that there's struggles going on, and there are going to be struggles. But if you want a blessed household, God has to be first. Preach it, right? Is that what you said, Buster? Preach it. That's... Psalm 128, begin at verse 1. Blessed are all who fear the Lord, who walk in obedience to Him. You will eat the fruit of your labor. Blessings and prosperity will be yours. Your wife will be like a fruitful vine within your house. Your children will be like olive shoots around your table. Yes, this will be the blessing for the man who fears the Lord. God comes first. The fear of the Lord in you is reflected to your family and your children. And we should all fear God. Part of the problem in society today is people don't fear God anymore. Many people don't. They think it's a big myth and it's a bunch of stories. We need to pray for those people, amen? They've got a rude awakening coming. Show our family. This is very important too. Show our family and our children what a happy home and a marriage, a happy marriage looks like. A fulfilling marriage looks like. Proverbs 24. Begin at verse 3. By wisdom a house is built and through understanding it is established through knowledge its rooms are filled with rare and beautiful treasures. These two verses have nothing to do with building. Establishing or firming up of the home it has nothing to do with that. They're not talking about a physical foundation built with a hammer and nails. The foundation being built here is a, about a biblical truth in everyday life that they're talking about. It's about conducting our relationship with wisdom, understanding, and knowledge. Think about those three things. If you conduct your family life, your home life, your spiritual life with wisdom. Number one, wisdom from God. Understanding. Understanding each situation. And the knowledge that the Bible provides. Because the, everything you need to know is in this book. Everything you need to know about marriage, everything you need to know about family life, everything you need about at home, and more is in the book. We just got to open it up and use it. By wisdom a house is built. By wisdom you start with God and a house is built. By understanding it is established. Because everyone in your household should understand who you serve if you are leading. Amen? And by knowledge the rooms are filled with precious riches. By knowledge. You're able to share that with your family, your children, your friends. And does our marriage in today's home reflect God? Does your marriage reflect God? Does, does ours? That's the question. Our marriage should reflect what God says it should look like. God tells us what a marriage should look like and what it should be. But does your marriage reflect that? You know, with the divorce rate in today's society and, and the problems and the two people working outside the home and the daily pressures and all, it's tough. It's tough. It's tough to have that balance, once again, between love and discipline. It's, it's tough to be balanced where your marriage is really reflecting what God would want it to look like. If you turn with me, we're going to Ephesians. Chapter 5, beginning at verse 21. Ephesians chapter 5, beginning at verse 21. It says, submit, your, <clears throat> submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should 
should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wife, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with the water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. It's called love and respect. We've done a, a Bible study on that before, but it's called love and respect. And if you look, if you think about it, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Now, in, in this particular scripture, women have a hard time with this word submit. They really do. I mean, I, every once in a while, I'll get ready to, to uh, perform a wedding, and that's the first thing in counseling. The wife says, hey, can you take that little submit thing out of there? You know what I say? No. You need to understand what that truly means because it doesn't mean what your husband thinks it means or it's going to mean, right? So people have a problem with that. And in this scripture, Paul is calling us to mutual submission, not one where the other person is in submission and to another that's in authority, but that we would submit to one another. Be equal. Be equal. I read a part where they said, you know, uh, God took a rib from man to make woman. It didn't come from his head and, head and it didn't come from his feet. So it's not supposed to be downgrading her and talking down to her. And she's not supposed to be under his feet. She's supposed to be as equal. And sometimes we lose sight of that. And in, and in that particular scripture, sometimes they do. Christian su submission is not about being a doormat to anybody. To anybody, male or female. So there's some changes that make a difference in a household. Marriage is about being together as one, one flesh. That's what it says, amen? And your family can tell when you're out of step with each other. Your children can tell when you're out of step with each other. When there's a little, when there's just a little bit of friction going on there in the home, they can tell. They can feel, they can feel when love is all around the house too. That's very easily and they know when it's not. If we're reflecting God in our marriage, then our children, our family, and our friends will ultimately see how God's wisdom is used in that marriage and the understanding of the leadership in our homes. So, gentlemen, today, understand that your leadership, you are the pastor of your household, men. You are, you are called to be the pastor of your household. You are the spiritual leader of your household. You are not the master. You are not the tyrant. You're not the king. There's only one king. Amen? So you have to remember that. Now, ladies, love me for this. Come on, preach it, Reg. <laughs> Guys are over there going, hey, 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 calm down. <laughs> Marriage and family can be a job. All of you know that. It can be a job. But it can be enjoyable. It can be very enjoyable if you make it that way. My marriage and my wife's, Terry, became so much stronger not long after we found Jesus and invited him into our hearts and into our home. Our children, our family, our friends, they saw it. And we know that God used our marriage and our home to show others what a godly marriage should look like. When you put him first in our lives. My wife and I are on fire for God today just like we were when we first accepted Him. It just keeps getting stronger and stronger. Our marriage has gotten stronger and stronger and stronger. Where There's a give and take there where we understand each other better. But we're both running the same direction and that's toward God. Amen? Side by side, we're running toward God and that means we're on the right track. Amen? So uh, my wife always told me that sharing with people if they found the right person, if they found the right person in their life that they want to marry. She says, take off running as hard as you can toward God, and if you look over and that person's running beside you, that's the person you need to be with right there. I agree. I agree 
And you don't need to take things personal. You don't need to sweat the small stuff. I know all about that. I am like Tim the tool man Taylor. I make these little mistakes every once in a while. I went on a trip with my wife and my granddaughter, oldest granddaughter, to Yellowstone last year. And it was an interesting trip. We've got a little cab over camper we put on the truck, and, you know, we took off, and, you know, it's a little cramped in there, and after you spend a few days together, you can get a little touchy with one another, but we managed very, very well. You know, it wasn't bad. It was a fun trip. We'd never been up in that area of, of the United States, so it was exciting. The problem that I have is I own my own company, and I don't know how to leave a cell phone alone. I don't know how to leave my iPad alone, checking on jobs. or to, And I don't know how not to talk to somebody here at the church if they got something going on. Even if they need to know, you know, simple things. I, I'm not good at not picking up my phone. So when we were, before we got to Yellowstone, we were somewhere in Wyoming, I'm not sure, but we stopped. We stopped at a, a, a gas station there, a truck stop somewhere, and we, we actually uh, got something to drink, the restroom break, the whole deal, and and my granddaughter was riding in the, uh, in the back seat, and my wife's riding in the front seat, and we pull up there, and we stop, and I go in, and I get me a drink, take care of business, get fuel, come back out and get in the truck. My phone rings, and it's business, and I'm talking business, and my granddaughter comes back, and she jumps in the front seat with me and closes the door, puts on her seat belt, and we left. I drove off talking on the cell phone. Now, it gets worse. Hang on. There's only one way to go out of this parking lot, and when you go out and you get on the freeway, then you're going to go down there about 10 miles or more before you can turn around and come back. And me, I'm sitting at the light, right? So I got off the phone, and I looked over at my granddaughter, and I go, well, where's Nene? Because that's what she calls her. And she, go, he goes, she goes, well, I think she's in the back in the camper. I knew she wasn't back there because she wouldn't ride back there with the truck moving. I go, uh-oh. <laughs> I mean, what do you do, right? So I'm sitting at this traffic light, and there are cars behind me. I can't back up. I can't even turn around, so I've got to go through the light and go across and this loops up on the freeway. Well, it scared me so bad <laughs> that I did an illegal deal, went across there, cut across that big median, and turned around and stopped at the traffic light going back the other way. Guess where my wife was? <laughs> Standing in the parking lot looking right at me. <laughs> you know, your heart's beating about 90 miles an hour. <laughs> if you know my wife, and she's kind of smiling, <laughs> so what do I do first thing you do you go on the defense I pull up there and go where have you been <laughs> she forgave me she was okay she forgave me now did she get over it oh everybody knows I said Terry don't tell nobody this it was on Facebook the next day I... but you know what that could have turned into a mess right there yeah, you already knew about it. Yeah, yeah. There's some people that do know about it. But think about that. She forgave me. She, she tells everybody about the little venture. You know, it's, it's the give and take thing. It would have been real easy to get upset. You know, I, I tried to control all those emotions and everything. I'm pr pretty particular about things. We bought a, a one of those thick rubber foam memory foam things to go on this little bed in this camper because it's hard. You know, it, we wanted some comfort in there. And the one she bought, I kept telling her it's like for a full-size bed, but believe it or not, it was for a queen. So the one we bought was a little bitty. Now, Terry, I'm just going to go get another one, not Terry. She's going to take this one back. So she rolls it up, and if you ever try to roll one of them things up, it's about this big around. And she goes to try to take it back, and they don't have a return thing open that night, so she can't return it till the next day, so it goes on the trip with us. We did get another one. But, you know, she looked like Lucille Ball. She put that thing in a buggy and was rolling it across the parking lot, and I'm thinking, why are we doing all this? You heard me, guys. I'm thinking it. I'm not saying it. 
What I'm trying to say to you is don't sweat the small stuff. Laugh at yourself and laugh with each other. Make life enjoyable. Make your marriage enjoyable. And make your house a home. Put God first. I wouldn't even want to begin to think what my wife would have done with me when I ran off and left her if she didn't know God. I think I would have seen Satan that day, I guarantee you. So put God first. Make Him first and foremost in your home. Don't just have Him here. Don't just be one person here. Walk out that door and take God with you. And call on Him every time in a need, every time in a situation when you need help in your home. But walk with Him. Be like Jesus. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this day. We thank you, Father God, once again for your, for your favor and just the, the, the gifts that you just pour out here, Father, on your church family. And Father, we thank you that we do have this family and we thank you that it feels like a home. Father, we, we put you first in everything we do. We pray that we continue to follow you. I pray today that anyone that's struggling, that they, they have these things going on in their lives that, Their home just doesn't seem like a fun place to be. Father, I pray that they would seek you first in that. That you would bless their homes and bless their families, Father God. That if they they are walking with you, Father God, that you give them that clear direction. Father, be with us as the day-to-day struggles come into our lives. That the home is being destroyed. Father, let's make it strong again. We pray that you would have your hand upon that. Father, we pray that we stay behind you and we focus on what it is that you would have us do, not what we would do. Father, we thank you for the sanctity of marriage. Father, we pray that marriages that are struggling today, that your hand be upon them also. Father, we love you. We pray that everything we did today was uplifting, glorifying, and pleasing to you. In Jesus' holy and precious name I pray. Amen.